Welcome to the last session of week number seven, session six of virology part one. This week we've been talking about DNA synthesis of viruses with DNA genomes. And in this session, I want to discuss how DNA synthesis can be regulated. Here is the crux of the problem. Most of the cells in us or in most other hosts that serve as replication sites for viruses are not dividing or divide pretty rarely. And when a cell is not dividing, it's not duplicating its DNA, and therefore the machinery for DNA synthesis is turned off. So think about how a rather small virus that depends on the cell for its replication machinery would do if it infects a cell where the DNA machinery is turned off. Well, it wouldn't replicate very well at all, of course. So in general, viruses don't replicate well in most of the cells that are in us because they're quiescent. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the virus has to induce replication because it often enters cells that are not dividing. So viruses must induce host replication proteins, that is, the components of the DNA synthesis apparatus. So they basically kick the cells into dividing. And they do it by gene products that they encode. Here they're called immediate early or early gene products to, to show that they're made very early on after the virus gets in the cell because one of the important things that has to happen is the virus has to replicate its genome, so the cell has to be set up for that. So very early on, synthesized viral proteins kick the cells into mitosis. So here's a schematic of the cell cycle that we need to talk about a little bit to understand what these viruses exactly do. Now, a typical cell takes about 24 hours to go through a single cell cycle. The beginning of the cycle is just after the completion of mitosis, and mitosis is shown up at the top here as an expansion. And of course, mitosis involves the division of a cell into two, all right? And that happens in this region colored red here, labeled M. At the end of mitosis, the cells enter a growth phase where they increase their size. And then they may pass on to the S phase, shown in blue. And during the S phase, the cells replicate their DNA genomes. So during the S phase is when the DNA replication machinery of the cell is turned on. Then the cells go into G2, where they prepare for cell division, and then they finally divide. So by then, they have a double complement of DNA, so each of the two new cells can have a full complement of DNA. All right, now this is highly regulated, this whole cell cycle. As I said before, most of our cells are not replicating either at all or very rarely. And to do that, you have to control this cycle. And there are many, many ways that this is controlled. But there are some very important regulators of cell growth, and many of them act here at this restriction point. The restriction point is a point where the decision to go from cell growth into DNA replication is made. And there are cell proteins that are called checkpoint proteins, which monitor this transition. And they make sure that everything is right before a cell goes into the S phase, and they make sure cells don't divide when they don't have to be dividing. One of these so-called checkpoint proteins that operates at this restriction point is called RB protein. And RB stands for retinoblastoma. It's encoded by a cellular gene, the RB gene. It was originally identified in children with eye tumors called retinoblastomas. Our RB protein controls the entry into the S phase of the cell cycle. It controls whether or not the cells will start to make DNA, and how that happens uh, we'll show you in a moment. Now, when you don't have the RB protein, in other words, if you have mutations in the genes encoding RB that prevent the synthesis of a functional RB protein, cells divide uncontrollably and eventually they become tumorigenic. So this is why children without 
the RB protein or with mutations in it, developed retinoblastomas because the RB protein wasn't around to control cell growth. In general, when cells divide uncontrollably, they begin to accumulate mutations, and eventually if you have enough mutations in the right gene, the cells the cell becomes a tumor, and it can also acquire metastatic properties to spread to other tissues. So uncontrollable division is the first step in a cell becoming a tumor. So RB was originally called a tumor suppressor gene because its presence suppressed the formation of tumors. We now know that it is a restriction point or a checkpoint protein that controls the passage of the cell uh, into the S phase of the cell cycle. All right, what does this have to do with DNA viruses? It turns out that a number of DNA viruses interfere with the function of the RB protein. And that interference is how these viruses kick the cell into dividing and turning on their DNA replication machinery. This is one of the most amazing stories in molecular biology. This took a number of years to be unraveled, and we actually will tell this story uh, in the second part of this course. But basically, the story goes uh, as follows. The cell, during the cell cycle, there are very specific kinases, protein kinases, that is enzymes that put phosphates onto proteins uh, that are made. And during a very specific part of the cell cycle, uh, the retinoblastoma protein uh, may be phosphorylated, which dissociates the RB protein from a protein complex made up of these two proteins, E2F and DP. Now, E2F and DP are transcription proteins that are needed for the synthesis of mRNAs that encodes cellular proteins that are required for DNA synthesis, okay? When the, when the cell is about to go into S, these transcription proteins are absolutely needed to make the proteins and the enzymes that the cell needs to replicate its DNA. So RB is a checkpoint protein. It, it restricts the cell from going into S because it sits on E2F and DP as shown in this diagram and prevents them from turning on the genes that are needed for DNA synthesis. So as long as the conditions in a cell are, are not right for cell division, RB will sit on here uh, and uh, prevent cell division. Now when the conditions are right, and the, right, the meaning of right is complicated and we don't have time to go into it now. Uh, RB will be phosphorylated by cell cycle-specific uh, protein kinases. These, in turn, are induced by sensors that detect whether uh, conditions are right for cell division. They will phosphorylate I RB. When RB is phosphorylated, it pops off of E2F and DP, and then E2F and DP can sit down on DNA and help to produce mRNAs that are then translated into proteins that are needed for DNA replication. A little bit convoluted, but essentially you can see what's coming here. Uh, if the virus wants to kick the cells into making DNA, it needs to turn on these proteins that are controlled by E2F and DP. So the viruses basically have figured out a way to kick off RB from E2F and DP. The cell normally does it by phosphorylating RB but the virus does it by binding RB. And guess what binds RB? Well, for SV40, it's large T antigen. For the papillomaviruses, it's the E7 protein. And for adenovirus, it's a protein called E1A. So these viral proteins bind RB. So RB is in orange or gold here, and the viral proteins are in purple. They bind RP, they pull it off of E2FDP, and E2FDP can now go and turn on genes uh, that are needed for DNA replication. So the viruses, of course, want to do this because they want to kick the cells into the DNA synthesis phase. So they abrogate the function of RB by binding to it. And again, uh, these viral proteins bind directly to RB. So T is very interesting. T, of course, is an origin binding protein. It's the first protein made when SV40 infects a cell. Uh, 
So not only does it bind the origin, but it helps to turn on the DNA synthesis machinery in the cell. So this is a really neat way of getting what you need. The virus needs the cell to be actively replicating so the DNA synthesis machinery, the enzymes, are available. And it does so using these early produced viral proteins. Now it turns out that under some conditions, uh, these viral proteins can continuously activate cell division. And that can lead to transformation and eventually the formation of tumors. But that's a topic for part two uh, of this virology course. So I, I encourage you to take it because it's, a, it's part of a very fascinating story. All right, so that's an example of how some viruses can turn on DNA synthesis so that they have lots of replication proteins around so they can make lots of genomes and make lots of new virus particles. But viruses don't always need to make a ton of viral DNA. And there are some situations where viral DNA replication is highly regulated so that it's, it's low and not high. And this is an example of that. And this is in cells infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Now, if you remember, herpes viruses have three origins of replication. And one of the reasons for that is that some of them are active under certain conditions and others under different conditions. And when Epstein-Barr virus infects cells, it can either undergo rapid replication that produces lots of virus particles, or it can latently infect cells under which conditions there are very few viral genomes present. And that is because the viral DNA replicates only once per cell cycle. Okay, so these two different patterns of replication, one where you produce lots of viral genomes and make a lot of particles, Another, where you are very quiet, latently infecting a cell, making only one viral DNA per cell cycle, are carried out by different origins of replication. And so in, in the EBV genome, the origin that is responsible for low replication once per cell cycle is called the origin for plasmid maintenance, or OREP. And this is how OREP works so that you only get one cycle of DNA replication per cell cycle. This is a really fascinating story. So here in the middle is a diagram of our cell cycle. It's a bit different uh, from the one before. Here's the mitosis phase, the growth phase, G1. DNA synthesis is in S, and then a preparation for mitosis, G2. So what I want to tell you is how this OREP, the orig origin uh, for plasmid maintenance of Epstein-Barr virus, how it is uh, organized so the virus replicates its DNA only once per cell cycle. At the end of mitosis, we have in the infected cell a viral genome here in, in double-stranded DNA. Underneath this complex of protein uh, proteins is OREP. A key factor in the replication of the EBV genome from OREP is this protein complex called MCM. That stands for Mini Chromosome Maintenance Complex. Uh, this actually provides helicase activity that unwinds the origin and allows the polymerase to get in and replicate the DNA by mechanisms that we've already talked about. So this MCM is a key component here. MCM cannot bind to the origin unless two cellular proteins, CDC6 and CDT1, are present. All right, and these are cell cycle regulated proteins. So as we come out of mitosis, CDC6 and CDT1 are present along with MCM. They bind to OREP uh, to produce this ORC complex, which stands for multi-protein origin recognition complex. Uh, this allows polymerase to come in and replicate uh, the genome. Now, at the end of the S cycle, so that DNA replication occurs uh, only in the S cycle. At the end of the S cycle, uh, CDC6 is phosphorylated by a kinase that is specific for this part of the, of the cell cycle. Its phosphorylation leads to its degradation. The MCM complex 
uh, is released from the DNA after it's replicated. It is then phosphorylated again by a cell cycle dependent kinase, and that makes it go out of the nucleus. Uh, and so now these proteins are no longer available to form uh, a new uh, replication complex. In addition, there's an additional level of control afforded by this protein called geminin. Geminin is, a, again, a cell cycle regulated protein that binds to CDT1. So once a, a single cycle of replication has occurred and CDT1 is released from the replication complex, it's bound by geminin. It keeps it sequestered throughout the rest of the cell cycle. And only in M phase is geminin degraded, which makes CDT1 available for another round of replication. So after one round of replication has occurred, the cells go through mitosis, and now CDC6, CDT1, and MCN are again available. They can bind the viral origin, another round of replication, and then only after that replication is done, the, all these necessary proteins are removed or degraded or sequestered, uh, and then no more replication can occur. So every round of cell cycle, you get one round of viral DNA replication. So you have multiple levels of control of how that works, all tied in uh, to the cell cycle. Really a remarkable way of keeping viral DNA low in a cell. One division per cell cycle. So think about it. You have a cell with a viral genome in it. It is duplicated once during S. The cells divide. You now have one viral genome per cell. And as those two daughter cells divide, they will now each get one viral genome. So that keeps one virus uh, genome in each cell. And that's because the viral origin of replication, or EP, its function and accessibility is tied in uh, to the cell cycle. So that's an example of how viruses can keep replication levels low by tying their replication to the cell cycle. Uh, the last example I want to tell you about regulation of DNA replication uses uh, the human papillomaviruses as an example. These are viruses that infect the epithelium, and typically they cause warts, as I said. If they infect the cervical uh, epithelium, they can. In, in, when certain high-risk human papillomaviruses are infecting, they can lead uh, to cervical cancer. The viruses are introduced into the epithelium, typically by some kind of a cut or abrasion, uh, and the viruses initially infect the lower uh, precursor skin cells at the bottom uh, of the epithelial layer. And here you show a pap you see a papillomavirus infecting a cell. Now remember the papillomavirus genome is a circular double-stranded DNA, rather small, with a single origin of replication. So initially there is limited amplification of episomal DNA in these uh, precursor skin cells, and as these cells mature, they begin to move up towards the surface uh, of either the skin or uh, the mucosal epithelium, if it were the cervix. Here we're looking at skin, so this is eventually going to form a, war a wart. As the cells differentiate, they move towards the, the skin surface. And as those cells differentiate, uh, the viruses uh, first undergo maintenance replication. Very low levels of replication just to maintain the viral DNA in the cell. And it's only when the cells become totally differentiated near the top of the uh, epithelium here, then the virus shifts into a productive replication mode where you have thousands and thousands of genomes replicated per cell nucleus. And this is what the virus needs, of course, to make lots of particles so that it can spread uh, to a new host. So the interesting issue here is how a single origin of replication can either make very few genomes per cell or thousands of genomes per cell. And obviously, it involves the differentiation state of the cell. There must be different cell proteins made that are regulating this. And what, how that works, we don't know yet. 
but it's very interesting that you can take a single origin and have it more or less efficient in terms of making DNA uh, depending on the environment of the cell. The last topic I want to cover is the fidelity of DNA replication. When we talked about RNA synthesis, we made the statement that all uh, nucleic acid polymerizing enzymes make mistakes. And the RNA polymerases have no way to correct their mistakes, so they have a high error rate, which leads to great diversity among RNA virus populations. Now, DNA replication has a much higher fidelity rate. It, DNA replication is typically uh, makes about one error uh, in 10 to the ninth uh, bases polymerized. And the reason why DNA replication is, has such high fidelity is because the enzymes have a proofreading component. So here at the top, we have a strand of DNA which is being replicated by a DNA polymerase. And this DNA polymerase has made a mistake. It's put the wrong base in and made a mismatch uh, in this product. And you can see that uh, there's not good base pairing here. Maybe it's a, a T paired with a G, for example. The polymerase can detect that there is a mismatch here, and then a separate enzyme, a 3 prime, en a three prime 5 prime exonuclease comes in and chews away the DNA until it removes the mismatched uh, base. So it chews away the DNA in a 3 to 5 prime direction. That's why it's called the 3 to 5 prime exonuclease. The polymerase then comes back and fixes the mistake. The mistake has been removed by the exo and then continues. So that's called proofreading. And, and this is proofreading during DNA synthesis. And this is something that gives DNA synthesis high fidelity. And again, it's why RNA synthesis does not have high fidelity because RNA synthesis does not have this proofreading function. Now, there is another mechanism that ensures fidelity uh, of DNA replication, and it's called mismatch repair. And it's just another way of fixing a gap. In this case, we've duplicated a DNA strand. The product is in red. And there is a mismatch somewhere at, long after the polymerase has gone by. So there's no chance of fixing this uh, by exonuclease. This mismatch can be detected by cellular proteins, and their names are shown here. Uh, once the mismatch is detected, uh, an exonuclease makes a nick uh, near the mismatch and the offending sequence is removed by a nuclease, uh, and then a, a DNA polymerase comes in and fills in the, the, uh, the bases again. So we're actually removing a large piece of DNA to get at this single mismatch, but it is something that can be done after a DNA replication occurs. It can also happen on, on mismatches that are induced by chemical means. So for these two reasons, DNA replication is is highly faithful, as we say, very few mistakes. Uh, that's why our genomes are uh, relatively free of mutation uh, and why DNA viruses mutate much less frequently than RNA viruses. Now, these uh, mismatch pathways uh, aren't perfect, and that's why when cells replicate uncontrollably, they start to accumulate mutations and eventually can become tumorigenic. And there's also some thought that uh, during uncontrolled division, some of the mechanisms in a cell that are responsible for correcting errors uh, may be altered in themselves, which make it even more likely that uh, the cell is going to progress to a tumor. <laughs> ¶¶